Hey, how's it going? So I just wanted to sit down and compare a few languages that I've used a number of times. And this is just meant as light entertainment. I just want to talk about some of the pluses and minuses of some of these, maybe how they stack up against each other. I'm not going to rate them because they're all good at different things. And honestly, I'd all rate them 10 out of 10. They're a lot of fun. But without further ado, I'm going to get into comparing Python, C, C++, Rust, and Ada. Okay, so first up, we have Python. Now, why am I considering Python as a programming language you might be interested in for game development? Clearly, it has a lot of performance limitations, right? Well, I agree with that, with the caveat that those performance limitations breed a lot of creativity. Back when I was first starting with OpenGL, I used OpenGL in Python, and using Python had the effect of making every CPU call a lot more expensive, and it made me really think about how to optimize my CPU usage. A and this can be taken to extremes. So one thing that I found is the reason that Python is so incredibly slow, besides the fact that it runs on an interpreter, is the fact that everything is an object. So if I make a float, I don't make a number in the simple sense. I actually make a, a Python object, which has a value, has a reference count, has all this metadata and stuff. So I'm actually creating a class just for something simple like a number. So what I found is if I created a list of floats, and then treated that like a cache and passed that around all my function calls to write all of my temporary variables into regions of that cache and make sure that they're physically close to each other, I could speed things up quite a bit. And this is an example of taking things too far, but it's also like such a time, like it's a really good example of having fun. Who doesn't want to actually have fun programming? JIT compilation. So if you spent any time in this channel, you know that I'm really into like compiling Python to machine code, but that comes with its own set of limitations because we can't write standard object oriented code and compile that. We have to think of ways to use simpler imperative, like procedural code. Um, maybe if there's a way that we can express our problem purely numerically, then we get so many speed ups with JIT compilation. But it's, you know, it's just something to think of. Another example is if everything's numeric and we're JIT compiling our code, then we can use NumPy to make a memory allocator. So we can make our own like malloc, realloc, free functions using NumPy. Again, this is just like things which are heaps of fun this sort of way of working forces you towards data oriented design data oriented programming which is a whole lot of fun but with all of this you know as cool as it is and python is a good educational language there is a real limitation and that is the global interpreter lock so we can sort of do multi-processing but we can't do true multi-processing apparently in the future this limitation will be removed but this is probably looking a fair way into the future but on the plus side python is garbage collected which makes it more stable less prone to errors more secure and my measured opinion on all of this is that Python really shines, I would say, in developing tools, game development tools. You have PyQt for making modern GUI programs, and it's the best of both worlds. So you have the flexibility of making things quickly. You also are in a situation where performance maybe doesn't matter that much. It's really good for whipping things up. So next up we have C. Now C, I view as a really good educational language. It's really good for getting the fundamentals of computer science and computer programming. For one thing, it's very minimal. The language feature set is very, very small, and you're dealing with a very low number of abstractions. So maybe it's not as flexible as assembly language, but C is sometimes called a portable assembly language because a lot of C code maps very closely to some underlying assembly code, 
with the exception that there are crazy things you can do in pointers with assembly code that you can sort of do in C, but it's more difficult and maybe you wouldn't want to. But I digress. It's really good for education. You're dealing with the raw stuff, the real deal. Um, situations like file systems, like opening files, file descriptors, that sort of stuff. Simple multi-threading examples, uh, networking like TCP networking. There's heaps of really good beginner resources for these things in C. And C is a great place to learn those things. That's where I learned them. Next up, we have C's big brother, which is C++. Now, frankly, the benefit, though, the killer feature of C++ is generics. A lot of language bindings exist for C. C is maybe the lowest common denominator for language bindings. But things like GLM, for instance, is mostly made for C++. And um, the good thing is a lot of the modern features of C++ are opt-in. So you can really use C++ to write C code. That's perfectly fine. And then if you need a feature, you can bring that in and you can move at your own pace. But apart from that, C++ really is more of a practical choice. It's the case that, well, it's used a lot in industry. Um, Rust. So Rust is an interesting one. In the same way that C is an intellectual bedrock for learning the fundamentals of computer science, I would say that Rust also serves as an intellectual bedrock. So remember Doom 2016 came out and then Doom Eternal came out and there was that thing like people would go and play Doom Eternal and it would teach them how to play first person shooters and then they would go back to Doom 2016 and dominate. Side note, this video may become a bit of a flame war, but I'll say this anyway. I cannot play Doom 2016. I've tried so many times. Remember that little butler robot flying thing? The little companion? Every time he tells you, Sir, I've found that you can complete optional missions to improve your combat, your well, Praetor suit efficacy or something. I just, I shut the game down every time I hear that. And every time I go back to play it, I know that scene's coming, but I just, it's too much cringe. I just can't do it. Anyway, having gotten that out of my system, in the same way that Doom Eternal will teach you the hidden rules of playing first person shooters, Rust will teach you the hidden rules of memory management. So like the ownership model, the idea of writing safe code. Because Rust enforces so many compile time checks and puts so many restrictions on the code that sort of teaches you how to think about your code in a memory safe way so you know c and c plus plus are like soup they just give you the raw stuff they're like you can do what you want with it but if you have some idea of how to use those components in a, a safe way that doesn't blow up your computer you know rust can be a really good way to learn that stuff Rust also has a lot of, like a, mod, a lot of modern features like SIMD and multi-threading are very platform specific, but I mean, this is still experimental features, but the promise of Rust is that it's gonna make a lot of these things more portable, which is always good. Now, downsides of Rust. You've heard me talk about this before. Um, one of the downsides of Rust, although it's great for learning memory safe code, it comes with the downside of forcing that paradigm onto the developer. It's the idea that it sort of corrals you into its worldview, if that makes sense, which is good, but that is also like it's good and bad. It's a double edged sword. Um, over reliance on external crates. So there's a, there seems to be a strange attitude in Rust that we as developers can't write unsafe code, but if someone else writes it in their crate, that makes it okay. Now, I understand the rationale is because presumably the other person has tested it themselves and they've gone through it and now you don't need to rewrite code which could potentially be unsafe. But it has a really, for me personally, a really concerning undertone of like when someone else writes unsafe code, that's like a magical process that we as mortals can't engage in. That's really weird. I like to tinker with things. And... 
This last point that I've got here is maybe a bit contentious, but, but uh, the whole unsafe keyword. So back in the day, I got into an argument online with people saying that like, someone said that unsafe is a really good choice of words because it makes developers scared. And I think that's ridiculous. When I see, un so the thing with unsafe in Rust is that Rust is all about the compiler doing as many checks as it can. There's all the code you can write, and then within that, there's a subset of code which is like mathematically, provably, verifiably okay. And there are things which work, which are not in that subset. And that's what unsafe code is. It's code that you write that the compiler doesn't have the faculties to prove mathematically that it's correct. So my bone of contention is that when we see the word unsafe, we should think unprovable in the sense that static analysis can't prove whether this thing is safe or not. It's not inherently unsafe. But anyway, on from Rust and on to Ada. Now with Ada, I'm going to start with the downsides. I'm going to start with the downsides and I'm going to go to the benefits, the last of which is probably the reason to use any programming language ever. Okay, so uh, downside number one, passive aggression. So I understand that this is, well, this is AdaCore. This is AdaCore's website. Um, so it's not the official documentation, but it's it's a pretty official documentation. This is their write-up. This is Ada's write-up on object-oriented programming. First sentence, object-oriented programming is a large and ill-defined concept in programming languages and one that tends to encompass many different meanings because different programming languages often implement their own version of it with similarities and differences from the implementations in other languages. We'll try not to sound too excited about it. They go through this description of the basic concepts of object-oriented programming. And then they proceed to say, Ada dates from before object-oriented programming was as popular as it is today. Some of the mechanisms and concepts from the above list were the, in the earliest version of Ada, even before what we would call object-oriented programming was added. So they just got to take it down a peg, you know, because they just want you to know that Ada was around before ob object-oriented programming. So this ill-defined fad, like, lest it take too much of the spotlight, just wanted you to know Ada exists, by the way. Subtyping can be implemented using, well, subtypes. I'll be honest, I'm not going to glaze it, all right? Ada does have a problem with passive aggression. This is one of the reasons that I was making Ada tutorials for a while and then stopped because I'll leave it at that. Another issue with Ada is the propensity to force its own lingo for industry standard terms. For instance, instead of pointers, Ada has what's called access types. Instead of classes, we have tagged records. There's weird things like that. Like there's, there seems to be no good reason for it, but um, yeah, Ada has some very specific lingo that it forces onto developers. And then when you're looking up how to do something, it forces you into some obscure website from the 90s or something like it's weird. It's weird. Having said that, Ada has a specific vibe, like it is a different way of working. If you like to watch those like 1950s guy smoking a pipe videos, I have to figure out how I want it to look and make a plan for building it. It started to shape up as soon as I made these sketches. When I saw how I wanted it to look and made plans for building it. Plans. Sketches. Measurements. Wait a minute. That's what Don was talking about. That's what I have to do with my own future then Ada might be for you. It's the idea of like specifying things and then working the details out from there. I find it interesting. Also, Ada's currently going through a modern reinvention. And as someone who enjoyed that uh, late 1800s Byronic England era, um, I can really appreciate it. There's also a promising number of bindings for modern things like Volk Ada, SDL Ada, things like that. 
uh, and there is an active community. So I know I just talked about passive aggression, but the community is really cool. And probably the main reason to use Ada and the reason to use any programming language is you can name your kid after it. What, am I going to have two kids name one C, the other one C++, have them fight it out? Okay, granted, if I have a son, maybe I can call him Rust, but Rust is more of a name you would use for a pet. You have a dog, call him Rust Rover or something. But Ada, hey, you can, that's a human name. That's pretty cool. Um, anyway, so there we have it. That was just a bit of fun, really. Um, I hope you're going well. Hope you're working on your projects, doing more work than I am. And I will see you again soon. Bye.